Good morning. It's November the 17th. It's a Friday and uh, we'll be doing an internal audio briefing that we may release to clients on the Israel-Palestine conflicts. We're going to look at some of the developments and consequences of the conflict and its trajectory. So starting off, um, the Hamas launched an operation named Operation Al-Aqsa flood from the Gaza Strip into areas of Israel on the 7th of October. The assault was notable for its multifaceted nature and the significant number of rockets launched at Israel, with at least 2,500 Hamas militants breaching the Gaza-Israel border. The conflict escalated when Israel responded with the objective to eradicate Hamas. This includes massive and the continuous bombardment of Gaza's civilian infrastructure. As of November 16th, at least 11,300 Palestinians and 1,200 Israelis have been killed. Approximately 30,000 Palestinians and 3,500 Israelis have been injured and over one and a half million Palestinians have been displaced. So Basu, you showed us a very interesting map of uh, recent pro-Israeli and pro-Palestinian protests across the world. Can you talk a little bit more about it and talk about uh, the pro and anti-movement against the ceasefire and the war? Yes, sure, Day. So the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict has polarized the world into two camps, one supporting Palestine and the other supporting Israel. Uh, early on, Israel received massive support from the international community following the Hamas uh, operation. However, this support has been slowly deteriorating following the massive civilian death toll and destruction in Gaza. It is uh, very important to note, actually, that these two camps have not been established recently. They are the result of over 75 years of a continuous vicious cycle that has resulted in thousands of deaths and injuries between Israelis and Palestinians. So uh, pro-Palestine protesters uh, or, and supporters believe that European countries are not doing enough to help the Palestinian people and to stop Israel's operation of defending itself. They have also accused the West of a double standard in approaching the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Bhargav, would you like to comment on that? Uh, yes, certainly. So the double standards in this case is quite atrociously visible. And the double standards is especially visible when we look at it from the context of Russia and Ukraine war. Uh, the major major officials from the West, including John Kirby, the National Security Council or National Security Advisor, as well as the president of the European Commission, Ursula van der Leyen, have accused Russia of war crimes by for targeting uh, hospitals, schools, and civilian buildings. They have also imposed massive sanctions on Russia, disconnecting it from financial uh, financial uh, networks across the world. However, they have not condemned Israel's operation targeting hospitals, schools, and civilian infrastructure in Gaza. Uh, they have also not condemned the genocidal claims made by Prime Minister Netanyahu and his uh, ministers in the cabinet. So, uh, Basil, uh, can you take us through what would be the consequences of such double standards by the West? Sure, Bargav. So the, the handling of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict has led to a decline in uh, trust in the West, uh, particularly the US and Europe as the guardians of human rights, freedom and democracy. Um, the disparity between pro professed values and actions has resulted in skepticism, especially in Arab countries, about the sincerity of Western com commitment to the principles they advocate on the global stage. Um, this could uh, potentially damage the West's image, leading countries to distrust distrust and further skepticize the West's intention. It may also impose massive obstacles against Western cooperation with other countries, particularly Arab states. Right. Baga would also, yeah, good day. Uh, Go ahead, sorry. So just coming back to your points, uh, you've mentioned a double standard uh, in terms of how the world views Russia versus when Israel does similar actions on a military scale. Um, I think it's also important to point out the double standards when it comes to these protests and the fact that a lot of the pro-Palestinian protests are being uh, suppressed or curbed in 
you know, the so-called lands of free speech in the West, whereas uh, pro-Israeli protests are the only ones supported. A lot of countries have tried to ban pro-Palestinian protests going against freedom of speech and freedom of expression in these countries. So it is quite a hypocritical uh, standpoint to take, and it does show that the double standards of the West are also closer to home in the countries themselves. Um, I have a few discussion questions here if we'd like to go there. So um, I think we I think yeah. we would all day, and I'd also thank you for the internal brief. It's very useful. I'd be interested to get a bit of a talk through the map as well and what you can read into that, Basil, after Uday goes through these discussion points. Yeah, sure. Uh, so a few questions. Hamas is in the Gaza Strip and Israel has made that very clear and the world knows that they're in the Gaza Strip. So why are Israeli military operations going on in the West Bank, which is not under the control of Hamas? Another point is, why are Israeli settlers kicking out people in the West Bank, which, again, is not under the authority of Hamas? And um, it is now known that the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, facilitated the growth of Hamas over the last few years to counter the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which is based in uh, the West Bank. So here we have... A Western, the U.S. and the West supporting someone who's blatantly a corrupt and, um, well, very uh, colorful individual. How can they do that and talk about human rights or the rule of law or democracy? Is Israel even a democracy in the Middle East? So these are just some discussions that we could delve into. Uh, Basil, would you want to get us through the map first and tell us about, you know, the scale and breadth and uh, geography of the pro and anti-Palestinian protests. Yes, sure, Uday. So concerning this uh, graphic uh, that we saw that uh, maps out pro-Palestine and pro-Israeli protests around the world, we can derive that uh, pro-Palestine protests have almost happened across every continent. Uh, around the world. It happened massively in Arab countries. It happened massively in Western countries as well, uh, in Africa, in Oceania, and in Asia as well. Uh, the intensity of the protests is high. The scale of the protests are massive. We've seen massive protests in Europe, especially in the UK. We've seen uh, millions of people march in London, uh, thousands of people in France, thousands of others in Spain. Uh, we've seen also the same demonstrations happening in Washington, D.C. and New York. However, pro-Israeli protests have been uh, somehow, uh, um, uh, like the intensity was not that high and the scale was not that big. And it was only in a handful of countries, mainly Western countries, mainly countries in Europe and uh, the United States and Canada. And would you say that these are countries that are supporting Israel's military, Israel's military actions at the moment? So uh, the U.S. and the European Union, uh, as well as Canada, have been vocal in their support uh, for uh, Israel's actions. Some European uh, countries actually stood out, like Spain. We saw that the uh, social rights minister called for the prosecution of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, at the International Criminal Court. However, uh, uh, countries like Germany have uh, and the UK have been widely vocal in supporting uh, Israel's military actions uh, in Gaza against Hamas. Uh, we've seen a, uh, a little bit of shift in the French uh, situation. Uh, President Emmanuel Macron was uh, supportive of Israel's right to defend itself. However, uh, in a latest interview, we've seen him condemn the bombing of hospitals and the killing of children in Gaza. So these are some of the uh, stances we uh, saw uh, in the past few days from European countries, as well as from officials from the US, particularly uh, Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken. Right. Um, it is very interesting, especially the statements from the U.S. Uh, they're talking about we have given X number of 
X amount of medical aid, but in terms of the weapons and um, weapons deliveries and munitions, they have completely, they have diverted a lot of aid that military aid that was meant for Ukraine completely towards Israel. And it's just gone to show that their focus is completely here. And now Ukraine is on the losing end in the battlefield, and it does not have the support that the West said it would give it. So this has really played an important geopolitical role in showing the West's priorities. And we have to question what those priorities are at this point, um, especially Israel. As I said before, Hamas is not in the West Bank. What are military operations they're going to produce? Bargov, do you have anything to chip in here? Uh, yes. So it is a complex scenario. When we talk of Hamas and the military operations in the West Bank, we got to understand the Palestinian resistance is not limited to Hamas. There are multiple factions and uh, West Bank have uh, has its own factions, of course. This is uh, this does not include the Palestinian Authority, which is a recognized authority in West Bank, uh, which uh, which is which is collaborating with uh, Israel to some extent. And th what they are also focusing on is the ad hoc and sporadic uh, protests which do prop up in West Bank, and they're using that to uh, to basically crack down on these protests very uh, heavily and Hamas yes is a flag bearer of the Palestinian resistance but it does not enjoy as much of support nor does he have a base in West Bank so that's how Israel uh, defends itself I got that Palestinian authority you talk about though how much of it is motivated by getting money in from the West and then very little of it's moving Palestine forward. They've got a massive unemployment problem, massive issues in terms of nobody really wants to invest there in a sustainable manner. Um, you know, they may be recognised, but they may also be underdone a little bit in their ability and motivations to be either effective or sincere. Uh, that That is absolutely right, Paul. In fact, uh, Palestinian Authority lacks support from its own people. And that's because of multiple reasons. First and foremost is that of corruption. Second uh, is is that it doesn't really have any say in the actual governance of West Bank because it is dominated by Israel. It cannot quite literally move a pipe from A to B because it requires uh, IDF's permission. And uh, it is also true that uh, politicians who are manning this so-called Palestinian Authority are very much in it to line their own pockets. Uh, so the there are a lot of chronic problems which has actually led to uh, a division within the Palestinian res resistance, uh, as demonstrated by the dominance of Hamas in uh, Gaza Strip and Palestinian Authority in West Bank. And there's a lot of history in it, a lot of armed struggle which has happened in the 70s, 70s 80s and the 90s, uh, most notably the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, and how it split. And then there was Fatah, which was allegedly funded by uh, Israel and uh, Hamas, which was fighting Fatah. So uh, th there are a lot of issues within the Palestinian resistance, actually. And of course, at what point does the financial fatigue step in from the donors that are pumping money into Palestine after this event? Um, of course, people are putting billions and billions of dollars into there, particularly America, at what point do they go, this is an effective solution and maybe we need to turn the tap off? I, I would uh, I would read, uh, I would underline the fact that those who are actually donors are not actually interested in a political solution or a humanitarian solution uh, at all. So yes. uh, this, uh, this is indicative of the global humanitarian uh, funding mechanisms at large, and this is true of Palestinian uh, issue as well. Whether it's Arabs or the Western donors, uh, it is more of a propaganda machine as well as a PR machinery, wherein they, they pump in money in billions and millions, and they they do not really care what happens to it. And this is true across the board. This is true of uh, every other INGO as well. As, as we all know, including Palestinian Authority, most of it actually is lined by the politicians or the so-called donor agencies who are operating in, the, in these areas. Yeah, that said, I know America got very vocal in reducing and actually did reduce ex their expenditures into there for a, for a period of time. I think we're going to see a changing landscape that the American public in particular is getting very much educated and aware about how much money is going into Palestine from the states now. 
and I think there could be a more difficult ability for them, for the government, I mean, to actually keep pouring money in there. There's been a lot of vocal uh, criticisms of that internally, asking, well, why are we putting all this money in there? I think this is going to become a very contentious issue. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely agree, Paul. I think that's going in that same conversation is happening in a lot of Western countries who are where citizens are seeing the extent that their countries will go to to try to um, defend or prop up Israel in terms of uh, banning pro-Palestinian protests and banning the basic uh, freedoms guaranteed in Western constitutions. Uh, so this is going to be a real con conscientious uh, issue in the coming years. And I think uh, this is also a watershed movement for how people perceive the West and the West's support for its allies. And uh, yes. we can see it's very selfish. Yes, I think so. And I think it goes back to that discussion point we had last week, whereby a lot of these countries that decide to ban protests because it doesn't agree with the government of the day. I mean, then is there a democracy with free voice and free speech or is it a plutocracy controlling the democracy for their own advantages? Yeah, exactly. Um, more often than not, we find it's the latter. Yeah, and that's sad. That's sad because, you know, it's hard to maintain a position on the, on the, on the moral compass high horse when you're actually being hypocritical in terms of not only freedoms of speech, but also in cancelling um, protests and then claiming human rights when one side bombs uh, hospitals and, and civil infrastructure and schools, but when one of your foes does it, it's a totally different scenario. Uh, guys, really appreciate the internal brief. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Basil Thank Paul. and Bargo. Any closing comments on this? No. Okay, so I have a couple of uh, points to make here. Like we have rightly highlighted the hypocritical stance taken by the West, but also in, uh, we need to highlight the nuances which involves in how the wild get, world gets divided. So yes, there are two big camps, but at the same time, I would also argue there are there is a third camp which is trying to balance out with a very tight diplomatic rope walk. Uh, quote, unquote, uh, I'm talking about India and China, uh, both have interest in dealing with Israel, but both cannot uh, afford to antagonize the Arabs as well as the Palestinian cause. So India has supported uh, supported resolutions against the Israeli settlements in Palestine. Uh, so did China, but uh, they have also supported Israel's right to defend itself. So th there's a lot more to the the greater diplomatic divide globally uh, at the same time there are issues on the palestinian side as well as it is largely driven by uh, by religion rather than purely humanitarian as we have seen with the arab states supporting uh, their own kind rather than the humanitarian causes so with that uh, that's it from me baga of interesting point indeed and i think on the back of biden's visit to china and, I mean, it's been reporting Biden said, I think we can all agree that Biden read off State Department notes that said, and we don't want you getting involved in Russia or Ukraine conflict, and we don't want you in Israel or Gaza. Again, it's hypocrisy, isn't it? But we, the greatest superpower, the exceptional one, the one that the world must abide by, we can do whatever we want, wherever we want. And I, I think America, again, going over to make friends with China, again, doing what it does, poking chest, dictating and demanding and believing that they have, uh, you know, fatalistic right to be right, what they're really doing is, again, showing off that they don't have an ability to sit down and have a two-way solution or a two-way relationship. And I think that's going to be on surface more, you know, purely a PR visit to China in reality, just reinforcing what the world and what China knows in terms of dealing with the states it tends to be, uh, increasingly narcissistic, which is most unfortunate because as a great industrial power, and it was a bastion of, of values, but it's grown to a point where it thinks its values are the only values, its values are superior. So it's starting to 
uh, create a lot of fatigue. And as you say, it's there's emerging powers, not only China and India, but other major members of BRICS. And some people dismiss BRICS wrongfully as not being a powerful entity. Well, that's both naive and inept to think that be the case. But also, you know, the other powers, from notably Saudi Arabia and Iran, there's a lot of other conflicts emerging, the China-Taiwan potential for conflict, the Korean Peninsula. And it does seem that um, the, the United States isn't necessarily going about successfully furthering it, its bilateral and multilateral relationships. It's getting overly reliant on America, England and Canada and the whole AUKUS thing. And that's, that's of grave concern because these nations are not necessarily thinking independently. They're following blindly on the basis that they want to be a part of this geo, um, sorry, sorry, this sec homogenic security power. I'm not sure how long that's going to um, hold off for. And certainly as an economic power, it's already been uh, challenged by China, certainly on a purchasing power parity basis. But of course, even the security, um, a monolith, it's one thing projecting power. It's another thing being able to utilize it effectively for a successful outcome. Um, more so when it's being dictated to by um, internal political factions within the states that want to get answers and use the security forces and mechanisms in a manner that it becomes a political tool and not so much a fighting force. Look, I think that's winded up today. Fascinating discussion, guys. Really appreciate the updates. Thanks and for all your certainly. Yeah, let's circulate this internally and by Google Day, I'll leave it at your discretion if you want to pop it out externally, okay? Yep, sure. Thanks for your time, Paul, Basil, and Parvo, and for the discussion today. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.